All right. So welcome to the Nice Rack podcast. Uh, I'm Lou Malagrana and below I'm we have, Ryan. That's I'm Ryan. Ryan. And today we have our very special guest. He is a star in the uh, municipal government community. Mr. Bob McQueen, everybody, I think at this point, everybody probably knows Bob because Bob is pretty much involved in um, everything <laughs> that goes on over there with <laughs> and so on. Yeah. So, Bob, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. And please tell, make sure you tell all the truth, Bob. Don't don't start going too crazy with this. Before, before, actually, Bob, before you get in, before you get into that, I was actually going to introduce him as Mr. McQueen. But the last time I did that, he screamed at me. Yeah, he doesn't like, like it. That's what yeah, I, I'm not a. I'm not your father. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, as as Lou said, my name is Bob McQueen. I'm the IT director for the Township of Franklin. Been here uh, going on five years. Previously to Franklin, I was the chief information officer for the for Princeton, and I was there for 21 years. So uh, happy to be here in Franklin, and and making some changes. Bob, you're doing a stupendous job over there as we see you, as we see you making, well, you are definitely making some changes. You've actually uh, made some significant changes over there with the network. We know we've been involved in some of it. And um, we know that some of those changes are not only because you're very concerned about network security, but some of the, actually you'll probably bring up some of the compliancy for your insurance with, with uh, is it New Jersey, Jeff, is that the right way to say it? I got that right. Yeah, we, yeah, the, the Mel and Jeff for the state, um, which is the self-funded insurance company for municipal government that you can opt into, which we're part of. They have some pretty um, stringent regulations for cybersecurity and what needs to be done. So we've had to really adapt and change. Um, pros and cons. I mean, it's, it, you know, people felt like we had to do it quickly, but yet it also allowed administration to understand that we needed funding. So it, it enabled us to get some funding that we probably wouldn't have had to get or would have had to fight to get um, from our elected officials and, and towns. Um, but it, to me, I think it's, it's a good thing. Right. We, you know, when it comes to and, and, you know, the strategy always used to be, well, we have to pave a road or we have to get this for something behind the scenes that the public isn't going to see. What mm -hmm. do we want to do? Right. We want to do the public facing thing. And unfortunately, that sometimes consumes the budget, which leaves very little left for technology on the back end of things. So I think some of these regulations that are coming down from the cyber insurance company really have helped fund projects within the technology departments. And Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, in years past, the GIF requirement, I mean, now nowadays with the GIF requirements, it's certainly gotten a lot more tough with the things that they require now. Am I, am I wrong about that? No, it is definitely getting tougher and it's changing, right? Because they, they, they came out with initial, um, with initial plan and things that you had to meet. Then they revamped that. And in coming years, like next year, there's another big change. So, you know, we have to adapt this year to get ready for next year. So, okay. um, and it, it's everything from two-factor authentication to, and, you know, four years ago, two-factor authentication used to be in the phase three, right? Now it's in phase yep. one. So that right. got moved up. Um, so, um, but to your backups and offsite backups, testing backups, um, uh, third party vendors and who you deal with and some of the regulations that you have to go through with them. So it is definitely getting more stringent. Um, I do um, sit on a task force that helps um, identify some of these, these requirements that we have. So they're not just the attorneys and insurance companies throwing them out there. They actually <laughs> have spoken to somebody who works. I don't necessarily, I don't want to say I agree with every one of them. Some of them I think are very hard for, for smaller municipalities. But when you look at the big picture of cybersecurity and what towns need to do, I think they're good. And, yeah, I would say, I mean, at this point, you, you talked a little bit before about public facing and so on. Obviously, taxpayers are putting their money and they'd like to see things that are being changed. They're not necessarily thinking about what piece of storage you have in the background that's 10 or 20 years old or so on. But when you're site gets attacked or possibly breached, it becomes very public facing when they find out that their township has been infiltrated by some outside source. And and we know today that, you know, actually Bob Bob and I were doing a panel at, at GEMIS uh, just a while ago that we were at. And one of the things we talked about is that 
you know, people getting breached used to be you were the leper of society. Stay away from them. Don't go near them. And that's mm-hmm. kind of changed to more of, oh, you got breached too? Great. Let's go, you know, let's go have a beer together and sit down and talk about <laughs> how we can change it. And, and I think also even, even looking, and I know Ryan and I have dealt with customers who uh, have been breached and their insurance when cyber, secu- cyber insurance came up. And it was a couple grand and they would cover everything. I don't think they realized the extent of the damage because customers were calling in saying, yeah, we got breached. They paid $1,500 for the insurance or $2,000. And then they're, you know, cleaning up and all that stuff was costing them 30, 40, 50, 100 grand. And now the insurance company, whoa, wait a minute, you know. So I think you're getting all these strict regulations now. I mean, Bob, you can talk to that because you deal with it directly. I think we're fortunate. I, I don't want to say fortunate, but I think in New Jersey, you know, I feel fortunate to be a member of the Mellon Shift because being a member of GMS, I hear nightmare stories throughout the country on this. And other insurance companies are just canceling municipalities and government's insurance. They're not doing anything to tell them, you know, they're not, they have no say at the table. They don't have a seat at the table. They they have no say in what these things are that they're required. And then all of a sudden they're coming up and say, oh, wait a minute. Oh, you didn't do two factor yet? Well, guess what? Your insurance is canceled. Yeah. When being part of the Mellon GIF in New Jersey, we kind of know ahead of time, I don't want to say a lot of notice, right? We might have a year notice to say, hey, you've got to do this by this time frame in order to stay compliant. So it is, I, I feel that's a benefit for us here in New Jersey as a government entity. It's not that way across the board. And, and Bob, what do you, so what would you say to someone that says, because we are dealing with several, <laughs> let's say, municipal governments or police stations that say, well, we'll put in the budget for next year. And we know that they've got to fill out that that cybersecurity form from their insurance. They have to meet compliance or they either, I, I don't know if they get dropped, like you said, or if, or if they're getting higher premiums or whatever it may be. But, you know, is it difficult for you guys to go back and find that money? Like, you know, if it's, I mean, if it's not been budgeted for at the beginning of the year, I guess now it's a little more, hey, we're kind of getting into the scheme of things and we know that it's coming. But when they hit you with all this in the last what year or two, like what'd you guys do for getting money and something? Is it just reallocating things like, you know, the public swimming pool and get chlorine that year or, or what happened with that? No, I think there was, I mean, budgeting, right? Like I knew I had to do two factor authentication. So I put it in my budget, right? So, you know, then that it helped the approval process of the budget, right? Because in most towns, your management, your finance office and your council, Um, You know, like we have budget hearings, we have to sit in front of council and justify why we're asking for certain money to do certain projects, right? So, uh, so I I will say that some of that is, is budgeting and knowing ahead of time. And, and for those entities that didn't do that, you know, I, I also feel there's a communication issue, which is one of the things we identified through the Mellon GIF is that you can't just talk to the risk managers or the managers or, or administrators at towns. We need to know who your tech guy is or company is because they need to understand what we're saying and what's coming down the road. Um, so I think a lot of there was some communication failure between upper management and the technology wow. department. Um because they don't understand technology, right? So they don't understand what it takes to do some of this stuff. Um, so, I mean, yeah, th- there's definitely challenges and, and you have to you have to overcome them. Um, I feel that there's, uh, you know, like there's some things now that we're required to do that are added expenses in the coming years, you know, for, um, you know, you're gonna do intrusion detection, right? So you have to run these scans. So now that's it's another added expense that you have, and that's required now yearly. And I'm not saying they're bad things. These are things that are hard that 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 technology departments throughout the state, it was hard for them to justify the funding for it. So, but now it's required. So now the funding has to come to us to, to take care of these things. So I, I think it's good. And, and I think, I, Bob, I, I can say, knowing you pretty well, is that you've been a big advocate for getting, you know, the, the managers and the risk assessors to communicate with the IT department, because we spend a lot of time, I think, in some, maybe some of the smaller places or someplace where they don't communicate. And that's when decisions are made without IT. Pieces of software are brought in that don't work with what you really have, and they've already spent mm-hmm. the money, now it goes in the, you know, what do we do with it? Or, you know, actually getting them to understand, because, you know, 
I think a lot of people think, oh, hacking. Well, it's like, uh, you know, Matthew Broderick and war games. Oh, they're just dialing into my computer and playing video games, or it's a 12 year old in the basement. It's not that anymore. It's a sophisticated network of threat actors and really bad people. Let's just put it that, that really want to cause problems and, and get away with it. Cause whether they're in this country, outside of this country, especially if they're outside of this country, you don't really have any way of getting to them, right? If it's mm -hmm. not a hundred kabillion dollars, there's no FBI that's going to go after them. There's no organization that's going to ch chase somebody down in, in, you know, in Russia or China or France or wherever they may be. So I think it's, it's important. Like I, I know you've talked about this a lot is that people, you know, they communicate with their IT departments and they really give them, because I mean, let's be realistic. A lot of IT departments were, you know, in the basement where nobody saw them. They only got called when there was a problem, but they really have to come to the forefront with everything going on. They can't sit down there and just wait to be called on anymore. But to that point, th there needs to be some legislation change, right? The state level has to recognize, just like every municipality is required to have a CFO, every municipality should be required to have either A, a technology employee or company that, and it's mandated, right? right? They should be exempt employees. They should be mandated employees from the state level. And for those municipalities that, that, that their technology staff is not a director level, then you're already 10 steps behind. Your, your technology leader, manager, administrator, director, chief information officer has to be on that director level and report directly to management, right? They need to have that direct communication. And, and it's, that, it's important for that IT director to develop a good relationship with their manager, right? They have to be able to communicate. Right. They right. have to be able to talk to each yeah. other. Yeah. And I trust believe. each other. I might yeah. vote for you for governor next when you run. If you decide. <laughs> to run. So so Bob, let's let's segue that into something because this is really we knew bringing Bob on was going to be good, right, Ryan? Ryan actually of suggested course. come on. We knew it was going to be awesome. <laughs> so Bob, let's talk a little bit, if we can, because we're talking about government. Let's talk about GMAS. And I'm going to let you kind of run with it. So I know a lot of the vendors that we deal with, we spoke about, they kind of don't get the difference between the chapter and the international. And I mean, it's pretty evident what it is, but maybe you could talk a little bit about GEMIS, what you guys do, and then maybe a little bit of the difference between them. So some of our vendors who all should be tuning into this podcast know some of the differences because I've explained it till I'm blue in the face, but I think coming from an outside source like you would be better. Well, I mean, I think starting from the beginning, GEMIS, um, which is a government management information services organization for local, county, state, K through 12 and higher ed um, government agencies. Okay, so government has a lot of challenges that are the same throughout the country. So GEMIS International is the parent company, if you would say, and then there's a lot of state chapters that fall underneath. So when I joined GEMIS, when Franklin Township joins GEMIS, we join GEMIS International. We automatically become a member of New Jersey GEMIS because New Jersey has a chapter. And the reason is on the international level, um, we try to engage our members, but a state can do that better because they're closer proximity. They can hold conferences, they can hold trainings, they can hold education. They can hold lunch and learns a lot better because they're all in a close proximity to each other. So uh, GEMIS International is we have uh, currently we have 13 state chapters, but we have represent members in probably 48 of the states. OK, so we have members all over the country. Not every every state has a chapter and, and there are some there's some. I don't want to say there's some minimum requirements, right? So in order to start a state chapter, you have to have five people to be on the board of directors for the state chapter GEMAS. Um, you have to have a president, you have to have a vice president, secretary, treasurer, their required positions, and then two members at large on the board. That's what you need to start a chapter. GEMAS International will help you start. They'll give you $500 to start your local chapter, right? So if okay. there's states out there that don't have them and they want to get one, they can. Um, I will say that um, we, from an international perspective, um, we hold an annual conference every year, which you guys are very familiar with. You attend GMS Meets. Um, we hope that everybody will be in Alabama next year. I'm already everybody throwing Everybody will in be there. in Alabama next Hell year. Hell yeah. Well. <laughs> so, um, 
But one of the things that we have found is that government isn't going to fund all of their help desk, all of their staff to go, right? You can't all be out at the office at the same time. You need to be making sure you're still doing stuff in-house, right? right? So our GMS International Conference, more is the decision makers, right? They're the top mm -hmm. senior managers of the technology department that's going to decide what software they're using, what hardware they're using, you know, all of that type of stuff. Then on the state side, we do a state um, chapter conference every year, our New Jersey GMS Tech Conference, which is in April of every year. That you do get more of your help desk people. You can get elected officials that are coming to that because I want to invite my elected officials. I want them to understand the importance of technology. I want them to see what we deal with on a daily basis and hear these stories from other people. So, yeah. you know, you can get a whole variety of people at a local level conference. So yeah. I think it's it, it's really beneficial um, to have both. But we also want everybody to know if there isn't a state chapter in your state, you are still welcome to join our organization and we will support you. We're there for you. Well, how, how do they do that, Bob? How do they get in touch with you guys to actually start? Uh, a chapter? Is it just gmus.org or what's the best way to do that? Yep. gmus.org. They can uh, contact any of the board of directors, which are listed on our gmus.org website. Um, they can always reach out to me directly. Uh, we have a membership coordinator, um, Felina Harris, who is in North Carolina. She is phenomenal with helping people do this type of stuff. You can always reach out to Felina. Um, we want to make sure to, we want to grow the organization. And, and one of the things that, you know, we have found, you know, and it's funny, I was looking at stuff today because I just had a Facebook issue, social media issue here in Franklin. And then out on our listserv today, there was comments about somebody in Kansas that's having a Facebook issue. And other members are saying, well, here's a nonprofit government side of Facebook. And here's a contact name that you can get, which I searched for weeks to try to find somebody in Facebook that I couldn't find. And instantly by throwing it out there, you're getting information back from across the country. But it also tells me that my problems in New Jersey are the same problems other states are having. So we are there to collaborate and to help each other. Yeah, I, I actually think have a, I actually have a follow up to that, Bob, now that you're talking about the, uh, the different states helping each other out. Now, I've talked to probably a couple people at Gemus International when we um, we have the international conference. And they've they've mentioned that they've gone uh, they've come to the New Jersey chapter uh, the New Jersey State Conference. Um, is that something that you would recommend other chapters to you know kind of look into just to see what's out there as well, or you know what can you speak on that at all? Sure. One of the things that and the reason that's been happening, which I I think is fascinating, right? Everybody wants to make their conference better, right? So what they're doing is they're attending other state chapter conferences to see how they run it and what changes they could bring back to their home state for their conference to make it the best that it can be. And I think it's great. I mean, we, you know, we have had, um, we've had people here in New Jersey that we've welcomed that come from other states. Uh, Felina has attended other conferences. So I think it's really important for that to, to continue to happen. And I know here in New Jersey, we would offer a comp registration to anybody that wanted to come out to our conference because we want them to experience what we're doing here. Is That's it awesome. safe to say New Jersey's the best, Bob? Because <laughs> we're you know, <laughs> I have a seat on the international board. I can't say New Jersey is the best, but I, I, think, I think we do put on a, a phenomenal conference that's well worth it um, for anybody to attend. I think there's a lot of states that do that. Um, there's a lot and there's differences, right? Because you look at some of the bigger states, they may do a three day conference, right? You look at New Jersey where you can drive anywhere within three hours. Yeah. Sometimes that's a challenge because government isn't going to allow their people to stay overnight. So people, if you do a multi-day event, people aren't going to drive back and forth. Like, and we struggle with that internally, like in New Jersey, we're like, we'd like to expand our conference, but then we're like, you know, people aren't going to want to spend three hours a day, you know, one way or an hour and a half, two hours to get to a conference, turn around, drive home and turn, and drive back. Yeah. Because our traffic's, it, traffic's so, it's so difficult here. But I, I would say that from our perspective, being vendors that go and vendors that have attended that we work with, um, the feedback is always fantastic. A matter of fact, this year, uh, especially from the international, I received emails 
uh, so let's see, what, last couple of weeks, I guess it was two weeks or three weeks since we left. And all the emails were really positive from vendors, vendors that um, had attended before and vendors that had never attended before. Even though some of the last minute fill-in says it was absolutely phenomenal. They loved it. But they to loved. your point, let me just say that, that we like to partner with our vendors. We partner with StarNet to provide pre-conference training, right? So that is a benefit our members can get by attending training that is professional training that is done by one of our vendors. But we also, we work in a lot of different ways, right? We, behind the scenes, we have a listserv, right? So our members, and we don't allow vendors on that. And the reason we don't is because we want honest and open communication. So mm -hmm. if I'm looking at a product, I can throw it out on the listserv and say, hey, who has dealt with XYZ vendor? What are their pros? What are their cons? What's the support like? You know, and, and we can get positive feedback. One of the other things that we've seen happen recently is some of our long-term long vendor supporters, we've actually been seeing some negative. And, I, and I'm not, what I mean by that is there's members expressing frustration with a product. We as GMIS International Board, we have now met with those vendors and said, listen, we want to give you a heads up. This is what we're seeing out there. These are comments that we're hearing, and we want to give you the benefit of the doubt to make it right. So it, it works both ways for the vendors. We're getting open and honest feedback, but if we start to see some things, you know, they trick up about a vendor that maybe customers are unhappy or there's something going on, mm -hmm. we have that ability to take it back to you and say, listen, this this is what we're hearing because a lot of times people don't want to speak up to the vendor directly or they might think it's only one person saying it when we're starting to see you know 10 15 different people make comments you know we know there's an issue that, that needs that's, yeah that's really important because there's a lot of people think well it's only me and they don't open their mouth or they may be afraid that oh if i do say something there will be some kind of you know lash back at me or something when they don't realize is that a lot of people are experiencing the same problems, whether, you know, same thing when people just get hacked, nobody wanted to tell anybody they got mm -hmm. hacked. Nobody, they try and keep it under wraps. Now it's like, Hey, we got it. Let me tell my story. Cause we've attended GMIS events where people who have experienced a horrible breach have come out and spoken about right. it and said, here's things to look out for. Here's what we did to get it. Here was the good, here was the bad, and here was the lessons learned. And I think it helps because there are a tremendous amount of people that whether they've been breached or not, do not know how to handle the breach yet. Now, I'm going to say the first time that we help someone uh, handle a breach, I mean, we get training and stuff, but still it's like everything else. You can read all you want and watch all the videos on how to drive a car, but until you you know get in the car and put your foot on the gas and the brake and put the wheel in your, it's a different experience. Mm -hmm. So for people to bring that, e even when we're teaching class, I, one of the things that I love about the class I teach is so teaching to them, we let people input everything they can when people in class start bringing up their experiences and things that they've learned. Um, my first class, there was about 40 people in there, I think, which caught me off guard, but there was so much inter discussion, people bringing up things and offering information that, and it was actually an Office 365 class, was that eight years ago? And somebody said, uh, you know, this was really good to come here. I'm going to do a little more research before I jump on that bandwagon because there are things that were brought up here by you and other people in this class that I did not know. And if I had taken that leap, I may not be in a good spot, mm -hmm. you know, to do that. Kind of thing. And, and I think that's the best thing. And I, like I said, every time I teach class, first I say, the best thing you can do being in GMIS is to ask your peers, yep. ask them. Before you pay a company like us or somebody, it's always good to have it, but get somebody else's opinion because somebody may have the answer you're looking for. Huh. And it's not gonna cost you a billion dollars to get that answer, or they can offer you an alternative because the reality is when a vendor comes in, they're going to put their best foot forward. They want to show you their best their best effort. And there's plenty that are honest and there's some that just want to sell. And you really want to hear, hey, Bob, this guy came in and talked about product ABC. Did you? Yeah, I tried it. What happened? Well, this is what happened and this is what we learned. And you ask a couple of people, I guess, on the boards and they respond. And I think that's invaluable because, you know, customer reviews are very important. Right, not just hey, I've got the best label and I got the best product, but actually having other people give feedback is important, so you can actually hear about it before you go down that tunnel and you, oh man, I didn't realize it was going to be like this. 
you know, that kind of thing. So I, I, I love GMAs. I'm going to add the, the corporate membership, right? I'll throw that out there. That's for our corporate partners. It's $2,500 a year for them to join the GMAs International as a corporate member. And that gives you the ability to submit white papers to our weekly newsletter, do webinars throughout the year and get in front of our members, um, attend um, member only functions at the annual conference that we do every year. So there's a lot of benefits with that as well. Um, and I just want to add that one of the other things that I think that the organization is so good with is there's there's a there's vendors out there that have products that are more geared towards a private sector, right? To the non-public side of things. We then, if we end up, if they're trying to get into the public sector side of it, the government side of it, we actually help them and their engineers with, hey, we think you need to do this enhancement, make this change, do this, you know, upgrade. Um, we explain the procurement process because, you know, we're, as a government agency, we don't have a credit card to just whip out and buy a product, right? There's a whole process, <laughs> an entire process that we have to do to secure the funding and to procure a product. So, we help those those corporate partners understand the government side of things. Yeah, I, I would say, I, I know for a fact, I won't put the company name because I'm not doing any plugs until they actually come on and do the podcast. But I know for a fact that um, there was a vendor, it was only their second year there. And uh, they Bob spoke to them and you talked about the corporate membership, which we tell all of our vendors they should be involved in because the benefits far outweigh the cost. And when you think about some of these private organizations, the amount of money that they fund into things, mm -hmm. I mean, even sponsoring events for 10 plus, 20 plus grand, and you're talking about $2,500, you had, I know at least one vendor that on the spot signed up right then and there at Chemis, which is, which is good because they realized the value quickly. And that vendor actually gave us tremendous feedback. Now, to be fair to them, they didn't know what GMIS was before. They did not do a lot, a lot of government space when I spoke with them uh, about a year and a half ago. And I said, listen, this is a great place. Your stuff will fit. You have pieces that will go in. And GMIS also introduces other vendors in. So you're not just seeing 10 vendors yeah, over and right. over. You get all these vendors right. in at the conference and so on. But um, they have gone from doing a, a very, from my understanding, a very small amount of municipal government uh, joining GMIS, that has just, I mean, I, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but I know it's gone, it's gone up. I'd say skyrocket is probably a good word. At least from the people that I talk to as well at the international conference, it seems like it's skyrocketed as well. Yeah. Yeah. We have so many vendors gave us, I, I don't know, so many vendors gave us, I said, how did you do this year? You know, did you meet anyone? Did you, yeah, and of course, if you sit behind the table and you don't get up and say hello, people don't want to come right. talk to you, right? You got you have to be at least a little bit friendly <laughs> to get people to go. But they all came up and said, wow, it was really great. We had a lot of people come up. We had a lot of follow-up. And when vendors are putting in, as I, I tell a lot of our, our uh, you know, when we do our events too, it's like the vendor is going to put X amount of money in. What are they going to get out of it? If they're just putting money in to put their name up and they never get a call, okay, that can happen. But if they do this two, three, four, five, ten times, and they're not getting anything back, there's no follow-up. They're not going to sponsor anymore. There's, there's no reason for them to do it. But when you have something like Gemus, where it's very interactive, and and if I may say this, most, if not all, Gemus members I know are very loyal to the vendors that attend your conferences and support them. We have seen uh, people that we've met in Gemus over the years that have we have. Um, uh, built relationships with them and have interact with them. Probably we would have never, maybe we would have never met them, but now we've done so much interaction and, and, and uh, business with them and doing things. And, and like I said, like for us, there's some selfishness that helps us grow our business. But I, I have to say that I really like GMS and Bob, you can figure that out. I really do. There's just something about, and I know Ryan does, and that's why him and I keep going because the people there are extremely friendly. They're very nice. Um, it's just, a, listen, we've gone to other conferences. I'm not going to name any of them, but some of the big ones. And it's just you walking around with thousands of people and, you know, they only talk to you when they want to sell you something. Right. Kind but of, I, if you go to Jesus, but I think that it's very, I think that's exactly it too. You mentioned it. I mean, everybody's super friendly. Everybody's super open to having a conversation and that's what makes it, I don't want to say easy to, you know, to go to a conference like that, but it makes it fun too, because again, if you're having those conversations and you're having people come up to you and talk to you and be excited about things like that, that's what makes it fun and interesting and makes it a good conference, not only for us,
but the vendors we deal with too. Well, and I think part of that is, right, you guys, we allow our vendors, especially at the international level, to attend all of our social functions. You're at dinners with us, you're at cocktail hours or happy hours with us. You're interacting. I can tell you over the years, I have made more friends. You're not a vendor anymore to me, right? You're my friend. You know my family. I know your family. We can sit down and have a drink and talk about things outside of shop talk, but it's also you're a resource. So that personal relationship is what I think stands Gemus apart from other organizations because we develop that personal relationship with our vendors. Yep. Hundred that that is that I think that is kind of like the glue that holds it all together with Gemus is that you guys have just created this environment where people can come and they're welcomed. You bring vendors in that have never been there and they're welcomed. I mean, they, they're literally not just standing at the table waiting for somebody to come over. You guys actually welcome them from the moment they come in and register to the social events, to the dinners, to the com everything that they do, they're welcome. Like they all say to me, wow, this is really nice. Why didn't I know about this before? I'm like, because you don't listen to me when I tell you for six <laughs> months to get your butt together and get over there. Now you understand once they go in, it's once they go in, they don't want to come out. Yeah. I mean, not, not at least the vendors we deal with. And, and we tell them like, you know, it's a very, it, it, I don't want to use fraternity. That's a really bad word for it, but like, it's, it's, it's almost family, Bob. I mean, it really is. Everybody kind of knows each other and they, they're open. I think the social events are really where you can learn what people are really about because to stand at a table with a guy in a suit and a tie, tell you how great his product is and how wonderful it is across this, you know, three foot table, three by six table, whatever is right by table. And, you know, look at all his banners and he's handing you out squishy things and pens. That's great. But until you sit down with them and have dinner with them and actually talk with them or have a drink with them or attend the events, it, it's just a different atmosphere. It, it really is. It, it's not, it's not forced. It's not um, coerced. Mm -hmm. It's just, hey, come on in. You're all welcome. I mean, I mean, let, trivia night on that, on the night that we did that night, is probably uh, sometimes sometimes probably all bets are off for trivia though. Trivia, trivia yeah, can get trivia night it can get a little aggressive. They get a little aggressive, but but it's it's great. Like people really enjoy, it. and you don't exclude anyone. I mean that that's the thing. There's there's no like, it, I guess family is probably the best way to do it. But our vendors have found we found it extremely valuable. We have gone from a company that did zero government business. Uh, was it eight or nine years ago? We first met Gemus to it's a big portion of, of our business now. And a matter of fact, we were approached by another vendor at Gemas to work with them on stuff too. And, and matter of fact, we have several vendors that I have been approached at Gemas about their products. And we sat down and some of them were, were, were selling now and, and we've done, you know, large numbers with people on some of them, which is pretty neat. So it, it, it's just this ever evolving, changing. So like for us to go, it's a pleasure, you know, it's never a labor, it's a pleasure. Um, we really enjoy it. And, and I honestly can't wait to get the hell off the plane and get to the hotel because believe it or not, that's my vacation. <laughs> right. He's not kidding. Right. That's my vacation. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's so on. But no, it's, it's a great thing. I would say any vendor that's hasn't signed up for corporate really should consider it, especially when I get up on LinkedIn and start saying you need to get your butt in there because you do a good job. And, and I don't, you know, it, the thing is trying to convince them, uh, you know, to do it. And, and the first time, right. you know, you can stick your feet in the world. Oh, I don't like chocolate ice. Well, try it. Right. You never try it. Right. Try it and see how it is. Once they do it, nobody's ever said they've had a bad experience. Everybody said they really loved it. So, so Bob, what are some, we, this is good. Actually, Bob, this is probably gonna be our best longest podcast or most interesting <laughs> of all. Say that. So what do you, what do you want to say? Anything you want to say in conclusion before we tidy up? Because I could probably talk to you for, four days, but I know I got stuff I got to fix for you too today. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, again, I encourage people to, to if they want to learn more about the organization, reach out to Lou. He can get them in touch with me. Ryan and Lou can get them in touch with me. Oh, I'm yeah. happy to have any conversation. Um, you know, our struggles here are the same across the country and we're all in it. Um, when it comes to cyber, it's not a. It, it's now a point where it's about when it's going to happen, not if it's going to happen. I think you know we help shift that mentality. You know, um, throughout throughout the organization, all we can do is our best to try to prevent that from happening. Um, but you know, I, I can tell you, in the year my ten years of being an IT director, 
my focus has changed, right? I, I spend more time now on cyber side of things than I did 10 years ago. And now mm -hmm. I have to have staff who handle the network side and who handle other things underneath of that. But um, it's an ever changing industry, um, but I, 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 I love it. And I'm just- We can tell, I don't know where you find the time to do your things with all the things you're involved in. I really don't. And I always know that if I need something, I can always run to Bob for it. <laughs> it's cheapest or not, it's still related, I can run to Bob and so on. I mean, I think 10 years ago, Bob, it was, hey, you need antivirus and some kind of firewall, some layer three yeah. firewall. It's no longer that. Now it's, now you need to be looking at everything at all times. Right. You can't assume anymore. You know, we're not playing ping pong at 12 o'clock noon as a virus anymore. Now they're in there and using you to, I mean, it's just bad. It's really bad. It's um, even for us on this side, it's, it's focus has shifted for where you need to be and so on. But Ryan, I know, what do you want to say? I know you always have something good. Do you have some Confucius words today to end off or? What's the, uh, no, nah, I, I don't really have anything to add. I mean, every, you guys pretty much hit the nail on the head with everything. Like, like Bob said, I mean. These these are the two guys you want to talk to about Gmus Gmus in general because they'll they'll pump it till the you know till the cows <laughs> are home. Wait, meanwhile Ryan does all the speed dating and all I guess oh he did really good at the speed dating. I'm like he better. That's why I put him there. Wait, the wait Ryan, you didn't tell him about your Gmus tattoo Lou made you get. Oh yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah, that, on the on the next that episode, I might reveal that. So he's lucky he's only a tattoo. For next year, it's going to be branded. It's going to be all branded. Like Yellowstone. Yeah, Have no. you watched Yellowstone yeah. where they get brand? Was yep. it when the Gemus yes. brand? Yes, <laughs> yes. That listen, Gemus. It's a great organization. Bob has done this for so many years. God, I think I've known Bob for at least ten years now. I guess nine, ten years now. And um, I just want to say, you know, thanks to Bob for you coming on. Bob, you you helped because Ryan said, you know, we can keep going on and talking, Lou, but people are going to get sick of hearing our two voices alone. And he's right. I'm the only person who can listen to my own voice for a week <laughs> and not get tired of it. But um, no, Bob, again, thank you for everything. We really appreciate it. Ryan, as always, uh, Ryan's the, Ryan's the level-headed, you know, one. Uh, yeah, I try, the, try to be. Red Bulls. Yeah. Yes, I'm just a Red Bull lunatic. But other than that, uh, we just want to say thank you to everyone for listening. Like I said, this is probably going to be one of our best podcasts. I can already feel it because I'm like all excited <laughs> inside how well it went. And just so everybody knows, we don't script this. We literally say, hey, Bob, here's what things we want to talk about. And we just kind of let it flow. So we kind of do that. But um, I'm going to end it now. And then um, after that, we'll uh, get this up on the podcast. We'll be actually it's, it's going to be well, I'm saying that now it's going to be uh, this coming Friday. We'll have it up there. But when I do this, I'll probably cut this part out because it's going to say we're already playing it, if we will. <laughs> Other than that, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Ryan. And we're going to say goodbye. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yep. Okay, Bye. appreciate it. Okay.